I will welcome everybody to the Moving Beyond Earth Gallery here at the National Air and Space Museum. My name is Marty Kelsey. I host a TV show for middle school science students. And I've got to tell you, I'm really excited about this presentation today. Um, before we get going into it, I've got a couple of housekeeping details. Um, a lot of them that I forgot last time, so we'll go over some of them this time. Um, fire exit is back here. Hopefully we will not need that, but I want to make sure that we point that out. If you've got a cell phone, make sure that it's on silent. Um, we've got uh, some great speakers. We don't want to want to interrupt them. Um, when the presentation is over, no post photos and no autographs. We've got a couple other things we've got to get to real quick. Um, so if you can respect that, we would appreciate it. And um, this is going to be a great show. So um, we have two astronauts on stage today. We have Mary Cleave, who was selected in 1980 and is a veteran of two space shuttle flights. She spent over 10 days in space, and in that 10 days, traveled over almost 4 million miles in space. The, the, the numbers are just mind-boggling. And with Anne McLean, who was selected in 2013, she is a West Point graduate with over 2,000 hours of flight experience, including 850, different, 850 hours of combat mission experience um, in the military. And she will be assigned to a flight soon, I'm sure. And uh, we are also joined by Annika today. Annika is a student that I ran into a couple of weeks ago at a program here, and she was incredibly impressive. Every speaker that came off the stage, she went up to and asked questions of and got a picture with and um, just really had a, a meaningful interaction with them. And, and I started talking to Annika afterwards. I found out she got her first microscope when she was four. And uh, so I have invited her here today, and she's going to help me um, host this and ask some questions today. So please welcome all three of our guests. Uh, so when I got the call, I was uh, finishing up test pilot school right here at Pax River, Maryland, about an hour 
south of uh, where we are right now. And uh, they started making the phone calls in the morning, and I had been flying that morning. And so my phone had been in my pocket on silent, and I got out of the flight, and I reached in, because I knew that the calls were starting to go out, and I reached in my pocket, and I looked, and, it, and I saw the area code, and I knew that it was from Johnson Space Center, and I went to answer it, and when I was about an inch away, it clicked over a missed call. <laughs> And I was like, you know, in that moment, you're like, I missed the call. If I was selected, they're not going to select me again. Like, you know, they're going to be, oh, just call the next person on the list. And, uh, and so I was really nervous about missing this phone call again. So I tried calling the number back, but it went to, like, a central operator. Um, and I didn't get very si good signal inside the building. And so I was walking around all day holding my phone up, like, praying for it to ring again. And it took them, like, five hours to call me back. Oh, my God. And meanwhile, all my friends were watching me do this, so they kept calling me. <laughs> numbers and say, oh, just making sure your phone's working, you know, so, oh, stop, stop. But when I, when I finally got on the, the phone, and it was Janet Cavani, who at the time was the flight for operations director uh, lead, and she said, uh, uh, she said, I remember her saying, because um, you, you prepare yourself to not get selected, it's like, who gets to be an astronaut? Like, not me. Like, so you, you, you realize, like, you are 100% ready for no, but you cannot prepare yourself for yes. Mm. There is no feeling in the world that can prepare you for the second that you realize that every sacrifice you've made for 35 years just it worked it worked and you become you know it was it was completely overwhelming I fell to my knees I couldn't even breathe I could hardly even talk and Janet being an astronaut herself understood this and I remember her just saying on the phone it's okay just take a minute just take a minute I was it was completely overwhelming it was awesome um. I, I talked to a lot of people who said, oh, I wanted to be an astronaut growing up, and it's always intrigues me to say, 
well, why, why aren't you? When did you give up? Uh, like, at what point did you stop? And, you know, oh, it wasn't realistic, so I switched my major because it was too hard. Or, oh, well, I didn't apply. And I think, well, why, if you aren't an astronaut, how would you not apply? You know, you don't give up. You know, you, know, you, have, you, you just have to keep going. And it's funny, I got cut from my high school volleyball team, too. And I think that was, like, one of my first major life. Oh, I love volleyball. I was going to be. But something that I realized when I got cut is I went and started playing soccer. And I found out I really loved playing soccer even more than I love playing volleyball. So every time I experience a failure, uh, or, or what I thought was a failure, it actually opened other doors. And everybody that I work with, um, you know, we talk about that a lot. We, we stumbled many times, and uh, you know, I should say we face planted many times, uh, but you just you get back up and you just keep going, and you never, you never let anything stop the path. Um, so, what was the biggest challenge that you faced when you I think uh, 
I think NASA's job is to be at the forefront, forefront of technology and exploration. So I think the most important thing that NASA can do is to never stop asking questions. Because one of the cool things, I mean, we have so many technologies here on Earth that were discovered when we were investigating something different. Um, and, uh, you know, NASA's job is to look at big space, big universe, in, in far-reaching time periods and ask the hard questions and, uh, you know, that will end up trickling down and having very real effects on our planet. So the most important thing that we can do is, is to answer those questions, or to keep asking the questions, rather. Mm -hmm. What do I think? Um, usually, you know, we don't get to decide what we're working on um, because you're trying to help everybody do their research. And the way that NASA decides on what science research they're going to do next is they go to the National Academy of Sciences, which was established by Congress to give the government science advice, and they put together a panel of all these eminent scientists and whatever you know, in all these different fields, and then they decide what we should be doing in what priority, and that that's the process. So um, I was just in the astronaut board. I was you're, you're a technician. You do the work for scientists that are so unlucky that they can't fly into their own homes. Now, in just a few minutes, we're going to uh, take questions from the audience. We'll have a microphone stand here. And, and so be thinking of the questions that you guys want to ask um, here. But so yes. Okay. Um, with what you know now, what would you tell your 12 year old self? So this is an interesting one because if I, I it's, and I'm going to be totally honest with everybody here, and this is exactly what I would tell my 12 year old self. Uh, I I was bullied a lot when I was little. I was teased. I was kind of the dirty one, uh, you know. I, and and quite honestly, I didn't really enjoy going to school for that one reason. I think academics was kind of my outlet. So if I could go back and talk to my 12 year old self, I would say, hang in there, because the people that are teasing you today someday are going to want your autograph. <laughs> Who would you tell your 12 year old self? Oh, I can't talk about it. Now, so in the job that I have, I get really lucky and get, get a chance to, to hang out with amazing people. And, and downstairs earlier, I asked a question that I thought the answer was, was great, and that is how important is it for somebody that hasn't flown in space yet to get a chance to talk to somebody that has flown in space. And, and you both had the exact same answer to that. Yeah, as I said, it's, it's absolutely vital. Um, and any knowledge that we can pull uh, from the experience to astronauts is critical because something that's really unique to our job is that most of the people that train us on a daily basis uh, have never been in space. Uh, they're our trainers, and they're training us to do something that we've never done. And if you think about when you went to school or you learned your job, we're, we're so used to being trained by people that have done what they're teaching, right? But we get trained mostly by people that haven't done it. And so uh, we've learned very valuable skills from there, but there are critical pieces to being survive, you know, surviving, being a good crew member, uh, you know, take packing correctly, uh, that we absolutely have to talk to the experienced crew members for. Them. And did you see the same thing when you first flew? Absolutely. It was, I started working before the first shuttle flight, so the first, you know, after every shuttle flight, the crew would come back and we'd have a meeting and talk about their experiences and stuff. And that, that was absolutely incredible and so important that that's what we learned. Uh, Annette is going to ask one more and then we'll start taking some questions from the audience. So if you want to go ahead and line up, our friend John is here with a microphone. So Annette, go ahead and ask me. Okay, so this question is for you. Um, do you get did you get scared if you were out spacewalking and you suddenly got a notice that you were that your air was low and you have to turn return to the space shuttle? Yeah, well, I never got to walk in space because I'm too small. And in the beginning of the shuttle program, the suit cost 1.25 million and that was back in 1980. So um, they decided to save money. They don't need fit in the middle of the court. So the really big guys and the really small guys didn't get to space once. But I got I got trained as a flight engineer instead, which was really good. Cool. No, I think that leads to a, another question. How do you keep from being in the home, even being underwater in the neutral buoyancy lab and trusting that equipment? How do you get past that? 
uh, for me, a lot of it is, is meeting the people that work on the equipment and understanding how the equipment works and what is monitored. So the scenario that you just gave, you get a low, low oxygen message. We have designed in double redundancy backup tanks. We have, there are probably 50 people on the ground that are doing nothing during your spacewalk except staring at exactly the CO2 levels, the oxygen levels, and the power levels of your suit. And I promise they're going to know that there's a problem way before you do. And they have run uh, simulations and scenarios. Uh, one thing that I have really appreciated about NASA is uh, NASA really makes the extraordinary look ordinary by being successful. But if you actually went back and saw all the moving parts behind everything, when we sent an astronaut out the door, there are hundreds of people on the ground monitoring every small piece of that. And that's how I feel safe, because I trust them. Mm -hmm. A moment ago when I asked her a question she wanted to ask you, it was, does it feel bad when you're going up into space? Oh, well, it's so much fun because you get to go from just nothing to 25 times the speed of sound in about eight and a half minutes on the shuttle. So it's really a great ride. It's pretty smooth on the shuttle, too, because you can't pull more than three Gs without going in a spaceship. So. It's much calmer than you think it would be. The guys that do um, the ballistic re-entries, I think, have a much happier ride on the back end. <laughs> Good question. How about you? Hi, I'm Priyanthi, and I'm a second grader. And I wanted to ask, can you grow a plant in space? Can you grow plants in space? Mm -hmm. Good question. Sure. So, uh, so up on the International Space Station, they do about 300 experiments every day are going on. And one of the recent ones, did you uh, happen to read about the leaf experiment? So they grew, it was the first time they grew edible food, and it was uh, Scott Kelly during his one-year mission, they got to eat the first space vegetables. And so you can, um, but what's different is when you think about roots, uh, you know, the way that roots get nutrients, um, plants don't know which direction up is. You know, we're cognizant of the fact that we're in space, and so we know how to adjust, whereas a plant is kind of going, well, this is different. You know, and so they did that experiment to figure out how they could grow uh, plants, and they were successful with it, because one of the things, if we think about going to Mars, we want to be able to grow food. It's one of the ways that we probably feed ourselves. And one of the things, I got a chance to talk to uh, one of the guys that worked on the veggie experiment, and I thought this was incredibly interesting. The plants on the station, they don't look green. And it's because when you see a green plant, it reflects that green light. And so they didn't put green into the lights that, that they were growing the plants with because plants don't actually use the green light, they just reflect it. So when you see the plants on station, they're not green. And I thought that was really interesting that, that they had thought that far into it to, to be able to grow those plants. Good question. Thank you. Is there any special food for astronauts? What's the, what's the food like? So I think the food's probably changed a lot over 20 years. You want to start and then I'll talk about now? Okay. Well, when, when we were flying in the shuttle, um, I would just say that you do not go to space for the food. <laughs> it's, but if you go camping and you eat, eat the dehydrated food that you use when you're going on backpack and camping trips, that's it. But on the shuttle, we had... You, they're in little containers and you can, with a needle you put in either hot water or cold water, you dial in how much you want, then you mush it around. So, um, well, I pretty much lived on peanut m &Ms. <laughs> <laughs> Well, the big difference now is we go to space for six months, so we, we can't live on peanut m &Ms the whole time. Uh, and so actually the food nowadays, there's a, there's a great variety. Um, and the crew actually has a say in what goes up. So, you know, there's, for a week, week and a half, you know, you could probably eat just about anything. But when you get to six months missions, the astronauts actually say that it, uh, food is a big part of their morale. You know, you, imagine if you couldn't eat what you wanted for six months, you know, and then all of a sudden you got a treat, you know, you got to make nachos or something, you'd be like, wow, this is great. And so uh, they've actually started to think about it like that, like for crew morale, it's a good thing to have. And so 
We still dehydrate uh, food, and so pretty much anything that you can eat at your dinner table, uh, they can dehydrate and send to space, and they do. We have a great partnership with Texas A&M. Their food science program actually makes a lot of the food that we eat. Uh, and then we also have her provision bags. So if you like uh, peanut M&Ms or Snickers bars or a sweet things cracker, whatever it might be, uh, you can actually put in your personal provisions and send them to station. And if you want to see some of what the space food looks like, back in the mid deck back here, we have um, some of the, I think it's shuttle era food, that you can actually see how it's packaged. Oh, yeah. So when on my first flight, we flew with a, a, a Mexican national. Rodolfo and Harry Bella, and because of that, they sent up tortillas with us. And we discovered, thanks to Rodolfo, that tortillas are definitely better to make sandwiches with if there's microgravity than bread. So they started flying on all the shuttle missions, tortillas instead of bread. I didn't realize that was your point. That's, that's really cool. What's your question? When you guys take showers, um, where does all the water go? Where does the water go when you take a shower in a space? Well, there, there is no shower. Is there a shower on stage? There's not a shower. They, they tried to develop some, and I don't know if you can get out here. Right, so Skylab, they tried to develop something where they can capture the water. But honestly, it, it would use so much water, it would be such a strain on the system. And so you kind of do sponge baths. But where does the water go, especially now on station? Ah, uh, okay. So where does the water go in space? So we have, on, on the space station, we have what we call a closed-loop system. And a closed-loop system means that there's no, nothing put in and nothing taken out. So what does that mean? Where does our drinking water come from? So where, where can you guys think of that we can create water, or that water or fluids are created? <laughs> thinking it. Your bodies. Okay, your bodies, right? So actually up on the space station, we take the wastewater to include toilet, wastewater, um, and any of the condensation out of the air conditioning ducts or anything like that, and we recapture that, clean it, and, uh, and serve it again to drink. So we like to say on the space station, we, we make yesterday's coffee, tomorrow's coffee. <laughs> <laughs> and, and Mary, do you? Yeah, on the, um, on the shuttle, we used um, fuel cells for electricity, so we always had waste leftover water from putting hydrogen and oxygen together. So we actually dumped water on orbit, and we had wastewater we were dumped on orbit. And, uh, I was working with the guys who had been having a problem with ice um, damaging the tiles on reentry. So I was working with the guys in crew systems and thermal, and we did an, an experimental dual wastewater water dump over Houston, Texas just so they could get up on top of mission control and film it. And um, what I didn't understand until I got back was everybody in Houston thought it was a UFO. <laughs> so it's a really a, a big tail. And it was very, and we did it on, you know, where, where the show was in sunlight and the earth was dark. So it was a pretty good show and a much bigger reaction than we expected. We thought we were just doing a little experiment. <laughs> and you, your first job that you had on the shuttle kind of fits into this topic of conversation, doesn't it? Yes. <laughs> Can you yes. tell us what your first job was? Yes. Well, when I went to school, before environmental engineers were called environmental engineers, they were called sanitary engineers. And so I was a sanitary engineer. And when I got down to Houston in my astronaut class, they were all astronomers and test pilots and everything. And then we'd all stand up and introduce ourselves. And I'd stand up and go, hi, I'm Mary Cleave, sanitary engineer. And everybody would go, what are you doing in this class? You know. And then on the first shuttle flight, the head didn't work. And so I got the first job on out of the bucket, which was fix the head. Which I tried to explain to John Young, I was used to working at the other end of the pipe. But he says, you're a smart girl, you'll figure it out. And I did, along with about 50 other engineers. So. And I think that goes to the point that there are no unimportant jobs. Absolutely. Uh, you know, there was engineers just this week, we were looking at a new uh, design for the toilet that's going to be on the line. You know, it's not the most glamorous thing, but it's reality. When you're keeping human, human beings alive and clean up in space, uh, you know, there's engineers that are working full time on that. And those are absolutely critical components. Uh, you know, when we talk about it's hard to go to Mars, we, we think 
about the big things like radiation and everything else, but you have to think about the little things too. You know, we up on space station, we have sent replacement parts for our hygiene equipment that we didn't, didn't expect to break. If something like that broke on the way to Mars, uh, you know, that's that's a mission critical piece of equipment when you're sending humans places. So very important. And the, the backup system is the same that they used during the Apollo days, still, mm -hmm. which is basically a bag. <laughs> Which you can see one upstairs on display. Yeah, um, so this is me. Um, I've been space when you're up in space. Did you ever see the Earth rotate and how slow was it if you did? Well, when you're up in space, you're in a free fall around the planet. And so the planet is actually turning underneath you. So everything, everything you see going by, a lot of it is, is rotation of the Earth. But it's, um, you go around the Earth every hour and a half. So if you go across the United States in 70 hours. So it's, um, it's, 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 it looks faster than you're actually. Um, what was your most favorite part of training? I know we talked about some of the difficult parts. What was your favorite parts of training? I think my favorite part is working in the spacesuit underwater. Um, you know, it's it's the spacesuit is like an aircraft. It's got its own electrical system and comm system and you know, it's physically challenging, it's mentally challenging, it's rewarding, and every now and then when you're translating on the outside of the station and you see this little reflection and you're like, hey, there's an astronaut over there, and you go, wait a minute, it's me. <laughs> you know, it's pretty cool. My favorite part of training was uh, flying in T-38s, which we had, a, we were supposed to fly at least 15 hours a month, and uh, I had never, uh, thought I would ever get into an airplane that had an afterburner, so I was just thrilled. And, and on your first flight in the T-38, didn't they take it real easy and you didn't want them to? Yes, we were, I was with a, a, an instructor pilot, Bud Ring, really great guy, and he, his, his instructions were, don't get the scientists sick. So here was my first hop in a T-38, and I was so excited, and he wouldn't do anything because he did not want to get but um, that was just the first one. <laughs> the instructors aren't so nice these days. <laughs> what? <laughs> okay, um, I have another question. Um, what kind of exercise did you do to become an astronaut? Uh, so physical fitness is really important to being an astronaut. And all of us uh, that were selected, we came from different backgrounds, we played different sports. Uh, for me particularly, my biggest sport up until right when I got selected was I played rugby. I uh, was fortunate enough to play on the national team for a little while, and uh, um, that was really one of my big passions before I got selected, and I learned a lot about teamwork. And uh, it's actually strangely one of the things that has helped me with spacewalks underwater, because when I'm getting bruised and physically exhausted, at least I'm familiar enough with the feeling that I can keep pushing through. So it turned out to be pretty helpful. How important, you mentioned teamwork, how important is teamwork? And, and yeah, I mean, you're part of the crew. And it just won't work unless you work as a team. And uh, you have to get used to each other. It's um, at least within the shuttle. You know, you you're there. If, if the crew works, it's fabulous because you have a family, and uh, you stay like a family for very long. Because you're still close to a lot of the people that you flew with. Absolutely. And were, were we were just down in Houston. It was a reunion for my first space flight. Like Thirty year reunion was this. December, we had a great time. You teamwork is still viable for NASA. Absolutely. The thing is about the team, and something that I, I guess I cognitively knew but didn't really fully appreciate is, you know, we always think about the team being the crew, and which is a very important piece. But that is only a very, very, very small but very visible tip of the NASA team. And uh, I had no idea how many people were on the ground monitoring everything and you know, every little call that you make down to the ground is going to cost 10 to 15 people to go do something. Uh, every piece of equipment that's on the station, you have entire teams of people that are monitoring that piece. And so uh, it's it's super humbling, uh, really, actually, to be the, the face of all these people that are that their life work is, you know, what you get to go fly to space on. And um, it's extremely humbling. And all, all you really want to do is make them proud. We've got another question in the audience. 